Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Today marks the conclusion of the second week of a coroner's inquest focused on the deaths of four Indigenous women who died while accessing services at the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter. APTN's Sarah Connors brings us a recap of this week's proceedings. Much of this week's proceedings focused on the death of 52-year-old Darla Skookum, a citizen of the Little Sam and Carmack's First Nation. Skookum died at the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter last April after staff put her to bed on her stomach. In video footage leading up to Skookum's death, she appeared to be unconscious or sleeping and unable to stand or walk on her own. Staff are shown helping place Skookum in a wheelchair and moving her to an overflow sleeping room. They testified Skookum appeared intoxicated but breathing and responsive, and it's common practice at the shelter for intoxicated people to be put to bed on their stomach. The footage shows Skookum laying on her stomach with her face in her pillow. None of the staff who helped Skookum to bed went back to check on her. Around 12 hours later, a staff member discovered Skookum's lifeless body. Footage shows bodily fluids had leaked onto her pillow and mattress, a normal occurrence when someone dies. Skookum displayed no signs of life and was pronounced dead at the scene by medical personnel. One staff member who helped put Darla Skookum to bed said he didn't notice her face was in her pillow. He also said that after reviewing video footage, he now thinks placing her on her stomach was not the best position to leave her in. Other staff said that while Skookum's death did not lead to any new training, they're now required to perform bed checks three times a night to make sure clients are breathing. The inquest continues next week in Whitehorse. Sarah Connors, APTN National News. Whitehorse. Thanks, Sarah. To Ottawa now, where the Standing Committee on the Status of Women continued their study on implementing a red dress alert system. On Thursday, the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations appeared for questioning. A year ago, NDP MP Leah Gazan filed a motion for the establishment of a Canada wide emergency system. It's to help address the issue of missing or murdered Indigenous women and girls. During the committee, she took the opportunity to ask Minister Ananda Sangari why only $1.3 million over three years for the alert was set aside in this year's federal budget. $47 million to find, to deal with the auto theft problem. And although I know that the auto theft problem is really tremendous in this country. The message is very clear that this country cares more about cars than it does Indigenous women, girls, 2S, LGBTQQIA+. I'm wondering why there wasn't greater uh, dollars put in, specifically in the areas of prevention, uh, to deal with this. Uh, what has been acknowledged, in fact, by your government and your leader as an ongoing genocide. The report of the um, of MMIWG calls for justice, uh, the 231, um, are quite large, quite vast. Um, and there is a preventive component and there there is a supportive component. The preventative component goes to the core of the social determinants of health. So, so our investments on housing, our continued investment on housing, and, and, and I recognize that, th that there are still gaps, um, I think is critical. I think the issues around uh, emergency shelters, $27 million for emergency shelters and transitional homes, homes um, on reserve, I think is, is a critical uh, point here. Still in Ottawa, Bill C-29 is nearly at the finish line to being passed into law. It will create a national council to monitor progress on reconciliation. Senate amendments on Bill C-29 were up for debate in the House of Commons on Friday. The creation of such a council falls under TRC call to action number 53. The Assembly of First Nations, Métis National Council, Inuit Taparit Kanatami and the Native Women's Association of Canada all have seats on the council under the current proposed legislation. But during debate, Conservative MP Jamie Schmall uh, asked why the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples has not been included. 
specifically the fact that the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, despite representing um, uh, a, a large number of Indigenous people uh, living off reserve, when you're talking about uh, those living off uh, uh, the First Nations, they represent status, non-status, Métis, and uh, yet they are left off the, the, the founding uh, table that then uh, dictates the, 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 the path going forward. A vote on C-29 is expected later this month. If passed, it will then be sent to Governor General Mary Simon for royal assent. A controversial silica sand mine has been recently approved in Manitoba. Earlier this week in part one, we told you about why some community members say it shouldn't go ahead. In part two now, reporter Sam Jones has more on what the mine's proponent and hollow water leadership have to say. An approved silica sand mine in Hollowater First Nations traditional territory is still receiving pushback. The Alberta-based company Canadian Premium Sand, or CPS, is the proponent of the project. In the first part of this two-part series, we heard the frustrations of Camp Morningstar, a land protector group in opposition to the mine. In part two, we'll look into CPS's responses to their concerns and those raised by others. Silica sand is sand with a high silicon dioxide content and is often used in glass making. The silica sand mined by the project was originally going to be sold to the oil and gas industry for fracking. CPS changed lanes in 2022 because, according to their website, it no longer makes business sense to sell the sand to the oil and gas industry. The sand is now intended to make solar glass panels in a manufacturing plant CPS has been approved to construct in Selkirk, Manitoba. The new plan sees the project considerably scaled back in scope and size compared to the original. CPS CEO and President Glenn LaRue says both projects are linked and construction at both sites will begin once financing is in place. He says they are optimistic financing will be complete this year. CPS has had at least one local community consultation back in 2019. Around 130 people attended. It was requested by the Manitoba Sustainable Development Branch to address public concerns. That year, CPS received around 180 pages of public comments, mostly in objection to the mine, along with concerns. They came from local cottagers, residents of surrounding communities, and environmental groups. Their concerns focused on noise levels, traffic and road conditions, water quality, and many worried about the environment as well as their own health. In 2022, CPS held a community information session unveiling the new project purpose of making solar glass panels. Only 35 people attended and eight provided feedback on their environmental concerns. Their feedback was shared in CPS's Notice of Alteration report. The majority of people were concerned still with noise and air pollution, and then water quality, animals, and fish habitat. Trucks carrying the sand will leave the facility an average of 50 times a day, five to seven days a week, based on CPS estimates. But Hollow Water First Nation leadership reaffirmed their full support for the project. In a letter to CPS, their chief and council stated, in part, we're proud to support this long-term vision for our community, for Manitoba, and for Canada. We see a future where we all benefit. APTN reached out to Chief Larry Barker through email, phone, and in person, but was not able to reach him for an interview. CPS CEO Glenn LaRue was unavailable for an interview with APTN National News. He sent an emailed statement. He said he's aware of some community members' concerns, but that he's also aware of concerns by leaders in the communities related to very high unemployment, related social challenges, and over-dependence on levels of government funding to maintain their community infrastructure and programs. The local leadership wants responsible economic development and employment opportunities in their communities as a platform to build a better future, and our project can help provide that. According to CPS, there will be up to 17 jobs available for operating the plant and up to 20 jobs as truck drivers delivering the sand to Selkirk. The mine is slated to operate for 35 years. It and the manufacturing plant combined are estimated to generate $200 million in provincial taxes over a 10-year period. Sav Jonesa, APTN National News, Winnipeg. 
Thanks, Sav. There will be new faces in the coming weeks in some police detachments in a handful of First Nations in Manitoba, many of whom are Indigenous themselves. Here's a sneak peek. Tansit, T.R. Wheatley, Niteni Sagasawin. I am here outside the city of Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, where we are attending a graduation ceremony for 10 new constables for the Manitoba First Nations Police Service. What exactly does this mean for some reserves in the province? Uh, what's might what make, make our course unique is we re-injected a lot of cultural pieces into it and a lot of community connection exercises and that sort of thing, so it's, it's, that's very important for the type of service we provide. Find out next week on APTN National News. Welcome back. Leadership and youth ambassadors of the Abenaki Nation from Quebec were in Times Square recently and lit up the famous New York City landmark with a message about identity fraud. They rented a billboard with the message, Stop Indigenous Identity Fraud. The Abenaki in Quebec allege that people who claim to be Abenaki in Vermont are not Indigenous. The billboard ran for one minute out of every hour for an entire day. Siguana Slashbell is a youth ambassador for the Abenaki Nation. She hopes the billboard raises awareness about the harms. They take our, they take our culture, they speak in our place, they take our voice. I hope that people understand that uh, identity fraud is a big problem and it's not only our and it's not only an Abenaki problem, it's for it's everyone. Everyone is a part of this and I hope that we can also create allies so that people can also defend us and be with us on our side and try to uh, not remove pretendians but call them out. A new six-part series that focuses on an in-depth look at Indigenous history was recently launched in Ottawa. It's now being screened across Canada, with Vancouver being one of the stops. APTN's Tina House has more. Understanding Indigenous History, A Path Forward is a compelling six-part series that just screened in Vancouver. It features in-depth interviews led by multi-award-winning journalist Lisa Laflamme as she interviews former Assembly First Nations National Chief Phil Fontaine along with lawyer Kathleen Mahoney. It delves deep into the history of Canada's relationship with Indigenous people and providing insight into ways to move forward. Out of this emerged, of course, as we know, the story that we've been told for, for so long, Canada it was actually, in the views of these people that write our, our history, is made up of two cultures, French and English, and a complete absence of uh, anything to do with Indigenous peoples. This feels like a good time to bring the lawyer in because it sounds a lot like theft, <laughs> you know, coming in uh, hundreds of years cross. ago and putting that cross sure. down. Well, that was the symbolic, I guess, statement of the discovery principle, which was created by the Vatican by the popes who were supporting the first explorers, the Portuguese and Spanish in particular. Put a year on that, Kathleen. Well, it was in 14, I believe 1402, something around that time period. This project is important, not just for me, but it's a project about Canadians, it's about Canada. And uh, our people, the first peoples, are an important, an integral part of Canada. But for the longest time, when we, when people have, have talked or written about Canada, there was always a missing chapter. And the missing chapter was about our people. The series crafts together not only the one-on-one -on -one interviews, but it also features various profiles of Indigenous people from across Canada giving their perspective from everything from murder to missing Indigenous people to residential schools to what it's like to be Indigenous in Canada. Produced by University Canada West, the series is now available on YouTube with various screenings taking place at receptions like this one around the world. 
it's an incredible piece of work, evokes a lot of emotions from, from you know, frustration, anger, <laughs> sometimes embarrassment of, of how things have unfolded across, across time and history. And, and this is our commitment as a university, as an education group, a step forward in doing our part to support truth and reconciliation. To sit across from Phil and Kathleen and really be able to ask any question starting, you know, 400 years ago and right up until today. I went through the education system in Canada in the 70s and 80s and these were not things I learned in school about our own history. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. To northern Manitoba now, where last week the town of Churchill lost their only waste storage facility to a major fire. The building was a former military warehouse and was being used to store the town's garbage in the winter. It also hosted Churchill's recycling program. Mayor Michael Spence said the cause of the fire was likely combustion. After the community closed its landfill in 2005, indoor waste storage was introduced to avoid attracting polar bears to the area. Manitoba Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Change Tracy Schmidt, told APTN News that the province has sent on-the-ground support to Churchill. They were working with the municipal government to explore short- and long-term solutions. Over the past few years, the town has been exploring waste management alternatives to prevent polar bears from visiting the area. Mayor Spence says the town is eyeing an incineration model. With this type of model, you know, there's other northern communities up the coast from us that have similar problems in terms of handling waste. So, you know, we're ahead of the game in terms of looking and advancing to where we need to go. So... Yeah, that's the first ultimate. ever Louis Riel Cup hockey tournament is about to get underway. We'll tell you all about it after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Yesterday morning, just before sunrise, Lee Wilson snapped this photo of an eagle perched on some driftwood in Kitimat Village, British Columbia. Thanks for sharing, Lee. If you have a great photo, send it to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at your Saturday weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, nine with showers in Halifax, rain and eight in Fredericton. Two with snow in Kuduak, rain and six for Nain. 11 in Montreal, snow and plus five for Valdor. Flurries in four in Sault Ste. Marie, six with snow in North Bay. Eight with uh, showers in Thunder Bay, six above in Sioux Lookout. Plus three with snow in God's Lake, six in Norway House. Sun's out and ten above for Winnipeg and Dauphin. A sunny high of nine in Regina and Yorkton. Thirteen in Meadow Lake, sun's out and ten for Buffalo Narrows. A sunny high of 14 for Peace River and Grand Prairie. 12 in Edmonton, a sunny high of 9 for Lethbridge. Showers and 15 for Vancouver, 18 with rain in Kamloops. Sunny and 14 for Prince George, 12 in Deese Lake. Plus 4 in Old Crow, 13 above in Whitehorse. Sunny and 5 for Yellowknife, 9 in Wrigley. Minus 5 in Saks Harbor, plus 2 for Politak. Minus 19 for Chesterfield and Whale Cove. 20 below in Resolute and Joe Haven. First ever Louis Riel Cup Hockey Tournament is taking place in Saskatoon this weekend. Métis Nation Saskatchewan's hosting the tournament for players of all ethnicities in the spirit of reconciliation. 12 men's teams and 7 women's teams are competing at the Rod Ham and Harold Latrace arenas. Each team must have a minimum of two First Nations players, two Métis players and two non-Indigenous players. The puck drops for the first games tonight with the finals wrapping up Sunday. 
Rich Pilon is Métis from Saskatoon. He spent 18 years with the New York Islanders, the Rangers, and St. Louis Blues. He's the MS ambassador for reconciliation. We want to bring all cultures together. We want to be positive. We want to be, have a great, a great weekend of fun hockey that everybody gets to enjoy. Not only will the winning men's and women's team be the first to win the Louis Real Cup, but they will skate away with a $30,000 cash prize each. The University of Alberta launched a new online magazine on Wednesday that will open doors to Indigenous writers and editors. Yarrowmag.com wants to give established and up-and-coming artists a place to publish that has an Indigenous focus. APTN's Chris Stewart has that story. So few of those Jordan Abel is the co-creator and editor of the newly launched Yero magazine. Abel is an award-winning and published author with over a dozen books. He says his experience with publishers led him to create a place to publish poems, short stories, book reviews and interviews with the content being 100% Indigenous. Most of the folks that, that work in editing and publishing are non-Indigenous. Uh, so when I went to publish my own works, I would often be paired up with non-Indigenous editors. Uh, and I, I think Indigenous peoples really need to be able to tell their own stories. Uh, we, need, uh, we need sovereignty around our narratives. So the Associate Professor of English and Film Studies at the U of A helped create Yarrow Magazine is you know a magazine that is meant to celebrate indigenous creativity uh, and the creative writing we publish is exclusively indigenous writing and the reviews and the uh, the interviews are open to non non-indigenous contributors who want to help lift up indigenous writing the first issue has a short story from writer and lawyer chelsea val on her experience in europe Poet and author Molly Cross Blanchard tells a story of a bus trip with a twist. There are book reviews, more stories, and Jordan Abel interviews photographer and poet to Neil Campbell. The writing that we publish you know, is, is meant to be the, the best of emerging and established Indigenous authorship. Uh, many of the authors that we've published have won numerous awards and are operating at the, at the highest level that, that you can in, in the literary sphere. Uh, but we're also very open to emerging Indigenous writers who, who need to, to get a foothold somewhere. You can read the first issue at yarrowmag.com. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Good stuff. Thanks for that, Chris. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Friday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca, or head on over and subscribe to our APTN News YouTube channel. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGuitch. Thanks for being with us. Stick around. APTN Investigates is just seconds away with the new episode Inside the Band Office, Stonewalled. It's going to be a good one. Have a great night.